And it was a, it, it didn't really fit into any, any stereotypes, you know. As kind of brought, it was a working class family. We lived in sort of fa a, a, a weird council house on the outskirts of a pretty village. So we didn't live in a mining community in Sheffield. We didn't live in in kind of like you know in in a hackney town block. But it was definitely there was very very, very sort of frugal background. But culturally quite rich as well. My mother was an artist, and my father was an obsessive classic, classical music fan. And it was this environment where if you wanted something, you made it yourself. My mum made everything that we owned. All of our clothes, she made all our clothes, she made all, the, all of the curtains. My dad made all the furniture. He made sort of speaker cabinets, this sort of thing. So it's a very creative environment. My mum was always painting this sort of thing. So it was a kind of a, it was an unusual, it didn't fit into the normal work, working class stereotypes. We weren't, we weren't sort of sat there in front of the TV chewing Mars bars and eating crisps sort of thing. It was a kind of different sort of thing. Um, I suppose they had middle class aspirations, but we, we didn't have much money. It sounds like a, sort of like um, Bikini Wolf and, um, you know, the sort of Bloomsbury group in Charleston, but in a kind of um, witty circumstance. So did, did, did they have... Uh, I reckon they didn't have yeah. sort of Bohemian Friends dropping around to... Um, no, to not really. Anything. No, there was no Bohemian Friends. No, the, my, my dad didn't really have friends, actually. It was a, it was a strange chat. No, no, I, no, his family was... He was kind of... He was very devoted to his family. And I was thinking to Brett, what's lovely about the book is, um, although Brett's obviously, you know, extremely talented, obviously, and, um, uh, and came from this very unusual background, um, and you tell your story in the book, up to 92, or yeah. 93, um, there's also something of the everyman about it, because I remember, you know, listening to the same bands and reading Enemy and Melody Maker, being absolutely obsessed by music, and that was your background too, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I was brought up in, you know, kind of... In, in, the, in the 80s, really, that's where I sort of, you know, when I started, started to sort of achieve consciousness as, a, as, a, as, a, as an adult, as a, well, as, a, as a teenager or whatever. And the 80s was, was, was a, you know, the music press in the 80s was, was, was a real charged battleground of opinion. I think that's, what I, that's the phrase I use in the book. Um, and um, the, the enemy was especially, and, and, and the murder making sounds when it used to exist as well. They were kind of like these sort of, almost like they were Bibles. You know, you'd kind of read them from cover to cover and learn everything about the bands in them. And, the, and, and, the, and they were how you found out about life. Through, and you found out about life through the music press and through bands. And uh, I do think it's a shame that we don't have, uh, and when I became a musician myself, I got caught up in this world, this very sort of like tribalistic world, um, Punch and Judy um, kind of style, uh, uh, um, journalism. Uh, and I was dragged through the press um, uh, and, and, and criticised a lot and also sort of hailed as an icon and all these sorts of things, these ridiculous extremes, you know, no, no, no kind of like finding, there was no sort of like midpoint. Um, and I and I and I think it's, I think the people it was almost like a form form of abuse in lots of ways. But but still, I think we're missing something culturally quite valuable now. We don't have that that whole world. I think the, 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 those headlines were quite um, innocent in a way because they would always be saying, you know, the Oters is the best new band in the world, or you know, Spain is the best new band in the world. We've discovered the best new band in the world right now. Yeah, everyone's the best new band, band in the world. Aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and the clever thing when I was at school about enemy was that, oh, well, enemy, they only build people up to knock them down again, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. You're actually were on the receiving end, though. You call it abusive because it's like, they're like a sort of cult. They, 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 they make you feel good and then they reduce you. Yeah, but it's, 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 you know, you kind of, you, 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 when you kind of enter into the, the whole world, you, you almost like sign a contract. You kind of waive the right mm. to... to to, 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 to kind of, you know, you, 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 wave, you wave your right to, to have any, you know, say about it in lots of ways, I think. It's, it's just, it's, it's part of, you, you accept it. It's almost like some sort of modern day gladiatorial contest or something. <laughs> Prize kind of like, is, 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 so, is, is so great that you kind of, you know, you just have to deal with it and take the, take the crap. Um, and it must have been something you sort of dreamt about and were <coughs> working towards you know, from sort of 13 or 14. I suppose so, yeah, yeah, just sort of slowly every day. I, mean, I think, you know, in, in, in those days, um, for me, uh, anyway, kind of music was absolutely everything. There was no other distractions, um, which maybe there are more of these days, I don't know. I'm not kind of 14-year-old boy anymore, I don't really know, but um, in, in my day, 
you know, it, it would be, everything was, was about music. It was, you learnt, you learnt how to be a human being through the bands that you loved almost. So they were your kind of role models. And, you know, they were incredibly important. So which LPs would have been at the front of your collection if a girl had dropped around to your... Um, it depends on when you were 15 to 16. Kind of, you know, when I was... Well, the first record I ever bought was actually the Sex Pistols, which I'm still, still very, very proud of. And then I kind of went into this sort of weird phase of sort of buying kind of odd post-punk records, like, like Crass and Discharge, and, and then sort of odd sort of plasticky punk records, a bit like, the, uh, a bit like kind of um, things like... Um, UK subs and stuff like that. Anti Nowhere and, League. Yeah, and all these kind of bands, you know, and Stiff Little Fingers and stuff like that. Yeah. So always very alternative, though. I think. Mm -hmm. I think I, I do think I, I, I think I did have um, with Billy Joel as an innocent man. Though, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Somewhere, somewhere in my record collection. I'm proud to say, still proud to say. <laughs> yeah. um, but make mainly punk. Mainly, yes. Yeah. yeah, until, you know, kind of the mid-80s when I got into things like the cult and stuff like that. Yeah. The cult? Yeah, oh. and the Smiths and all those yeah. bands and Lloyd Cole and that sort of thing. You know. But my first love was, was punk, punk rock music. Well, we were talking um, the other day about how there was this big thing about not selling out, wasn't there, in the 80s bands? Do you remember that? The alternative bands were like, oh, we're not going to sell out. We would never, they would never dream of doing an advert or something like that. Yeah. Um, but presumably, and... and it was better to not sell out and have a job and then do your band in the evening and not sell out. Um, and Suede, actually, you, you, were, you could have stuck true to a lot of those principles, didn't you? We tried to sell out many times. <laughs> <laughs> no, no one would have us. Um, tried to become mainstream, but it was, you know, no one's interested. I, I, yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, I suppose, I suppose so. Yeah, we kind of... I, I, it wasn't sort of fashionable. Like, you, you couldn't... You, you know, we... I remember, we just get sort of invited to award ceremonies and, uh, and nominated for things, and we'd never turn up. Because, and you know, the number of things we turned down in the '90s, kind of sponsorships and all these things, which I think nowadays it's much more acceptable for bands to involve themselves in because the, yeah, the bands have to look for money elsewhere. But you know, in the '90s, we you know we got nominated for five Brits one year, and we didn't sort of turn up to the award ceremony sort of thing, because it was enough. You know, we didn't yeah. used to do things like that. We didn't used to, yeah, we used to do encores, you know, we, we, it was a very anti sort of, you know, showbiz stance we had in those early days. And I'm kind of quite proud of that, really. And the whole thing that we did with B-sides as well, I'm somewhat yeah. like blowing my trumpet now. Yeah. Yeah. Go for it. Let's move on to something, something no. that's a more, more, more self-deprecating, actually. We love you. Um, well, what about the crack then? That wasn't such a good period. That's not such a good well, you did ask for something more self-deprecating, <laughs> um, yeah. and uh, well, I watched um, Mike's film about Swade, and I wasn't actually aware of that. I think I was sort of dimly aware that quite a lot of pop bands in the, in the late nineties um, got into sort of harder drugs, and it went a bit sort of dark. Yeah. Um, what, what leads up to that? Is it some? Because also before that, in the, I think you'd reached a, a, an amazing high point, and you're saying, you know, we just felt invincible. Um, and I guess the sort of, I don't know, the, the next step is. I mean, you're not actually, you're not a depressive. Wasn't because you were miserable or. No, sort of, I think it's you, you, when you become successful, you, you you don't think that you you don't think that you think that normal rules don't apply, and that's the way the way the way it's, it's part of the sort of hubris of success, I think, kind of like getting involved with drugs and lots of ways. Um, and I think I got involved with drugs it, it, partly because of that, and partly because I had a fascination with the, with you, Trey. You know, I had a, a, I, was, I was fascinated by by you know psychedelia and all of these sorts of things. It wasn't a sort of like a, a, a some sort of like childhood demon that I was trying to wrestle with and, and numb with drugs or anything like that. It was just a, it was just because it, it was it was kind of like it was interesting and, and, and it seemed romantic and strange and fascinating to me. And that was, uh, sh I, I'm ashamed to say, my entry point into it, you know. Well, I suppose if you're, if you're a, you know, um, Velvet Underground fan, um, and a Beatles fan, then at some point you think, well, I don't have to get up tomorrow morning, um, I've got some money in the bank, I'll, I'll give this a little bit of a whirl. Yeah, exactly, and, and, and a lot of it is, the, you know, it's the frustration of suburbia as well. It's, you know, it's a, I was a suburban boy looking for some sort of escape, and you kind of like, you, you know, you, you enter this sort of like tenebrous world through those, you know, pathways, I think, you know. 
Um, if you were living next door to at that time in your um, crackdown, uh, sorry, um, <laughs> near, near to um, there was a crackdown in Notting Hill. So. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't the usual, they were a nice crackdown. <laughs> <laughs> Had some uh, Tracy Emmons on the walls. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but you, you, you weren't really social. You, you were, I mean, you were just like at home the whole time. Is that right? You weren't going to the pub or anything or going out to the... No, party. I used to live in Westbourne Park Villas, which you know very well. And there's two big bars there. There's the, the Westbourne and the Cow. And, like, and I, I don't think I ever, ever stepped foot in either of those two. I used to walk past them. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yes. Is that the end of the that's, that's the end of that. Yeah. I, don't, I don't really know where we can go with it, really, without kind of like me kind of public, um, publicly humiliating myself. Aww. Which, you know, I can do if you want. Um, because it's the idler, we talked about this the other day, but um, the, we used to play Lazy by Swade. Again, Woo! again. Um, <laughs> which is such a lovely song. Um, and I sort of assumed it was about... Um, you know, lying in bed with your girlfriend or boyfriend a weekend and hung over and just lying and not being able to get out of bed and doing nothing. Um, but it didn't come out from that, did it? Yeah, well, it's... it's I am not telling you that, but the original... <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a song I wrote for me and my friend Alan, really. It's, just, it's a kind of a, 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 the morning after song. It's, it's that sort of thing. It's kind of like being up for three, for three nights and hiding from the world, almost. You know, hiding behind the blinds sort of thing like this, you know. But I was, I think that, it's, I was thinking about this, There's, I, I, I was anticipating that question because it obviously links into the idler and everything. What you don't know is that there was a very, very early song of ours called She's a Layabout yeah. as well. <laughs> which wasn't, it's not a very good song or anything like that, but, <laughs> but it's just really bad in fact. Um, but um, it's... It, it, it's it's kind of I think I was sort of trying to document the kind of the romance of the of, of the idler culture I suppose you know in a in a kind of not uh, probably a slightly different way to how you were trying to do how you try more popular way certainly well <laughs> I, I don't know um, but yeah and, and songs like lazy and trash like that I was trying to sort of like uh, try, trying to sort of like find my tribe and trying to sort of document this this world uh, uh, this this sort of sense that people can you know you don't have to accept what society sort of dictates as normality, I suppose. You know, it's a, 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 an askance view of society, I suppose. So, so laziness in that song is a kind of um, an act of rebellion? Yeah, I suppose so. It's kind of like, it's, a, it's sort of like, here I am, look at me, this is, this is my life, and, you know, I'm going to live my life like this, and, you know, you can make it that way you will. And have you ever had a, uh, a job? I can have <laughs> all, of, all of Suede cleaned toilets actually. Well, what is that? It's a cleaning toilet I'm thing. I'm very good at cleaning toilets. I kind of I'm right. very good. I'm, I got good, some. I'm good with a with a with a with a you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Woo! yeah. <laughs> no, yes, of course. Yeah. Um, I used to work in valve factory, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, no, not, not, not a proper job. Not, so, not, you, so you never had a nine to five PAYE situation. I, I tempt for a few years, but yeah, not, you know, nothing. Tem to do. Doing temporary work. Working in an insurance company, that sort of thing. You know, so very. Or taking calls or selling insurance. I can't even really remember. No, no I wasn't doing, any, wasn't doing anything that required any any brain powers. The sort of thing that probably you know can be done by a computer now. It's probably so, you know, just putting files in and stuff like that. Nothing exciting. Clean toilets, though. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, where are we going with this? Well, <laughs> little thoughts uh, uh, bubbling up. Uh, let's kind of segue into um, life now in the countryside okay. with children um, as a family man. Yes. Um, yes. And how has that been? Uh, when, when we spoke before, I said, obviously we should be turning up at the school gates, you know. Um, and you're not quite like the other dads. It's an, um, it's an amusing image for you, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> he, won't, he won't let go of me. He likes the, he likes the, the, ju the juxtaposition. Of me. He thinks I'm sort of like going to turn up with a microphone. It's not my microphone. I sort of shuffle in my North Face coat. And, you know. um, yeah. Um, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, I don't know. It's... Yeah, what was the question? <laughs> um, you know, we've got a bit being domestic. Yeah. Uh, um, and, and not living in London, not living that kind of a vain life. Yeah. Um, 
Is that been fun? I mean, do, do, you, do you enjoy changing nappies and tearing up skin? Well, I don't change nappies anymore. Um, I, I think you're confusing person with persona. So. They're, they're, they're two very different things. Oh. You know, so you've got to get your head around. Someone should write a book about that one. <laughs> and, um, but you have, haven't you? I have, yeah. 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 Uh, there's a chapter in the book called Person versus Persona. So, yeah. so, no, but this is an interesting point because, I mean... Um... It's something I think about a lot, though. It's, it is really fascinating, the difference, the, the, the huge chasm between the real person and the persona. It's, it, and the persona is something that the artist is themselves partly responsible for, but it's, it's something that's partly out of their control as well. It's a really fascinating dynamic that creates that. And there's a point after, there's a point at the height of your fame and success where your persona becomes almost like a sort of ventriloquist dummy in a bad horror film, where it's kind of like it's taking over your, you know, it's taking you over sort of thing. And it's a, it's a really interesting dynamic, I think. Is that why, I mean, you know, the, um, uh, you know Kurt Cobain, Amy Winehouse, is it because they just can't take that uh, clash, they get the too confused? I mean... I, I, I don't know, I think, I think for a lot of people, that, that they, they, they find a lot of disillusionment in success. They kind of they find that they feel as though they're betraying their kind of original values as a musician and all these sorts of things. So I, I can't really answer for them. I think it's a it's a struggle for lots of people all their, their whole careers. Yeah. Did, did you feel that at certain points? No, not really. No, I, I didn't. No, I, I always I always sort of wanted to be in, in a pop band. Really, I was kind of like I, I didn't have that kind of that sort of love of the indie sort of ethic. I, I kind of, I always loved bands that were unashamedly populist, but that would just happen to be good at the same time. You know, like, bands like the Smiths and the Sex Pistols and Blondie and these sorts of bands and the Pretenders and these sorts of things that I grew up with. They were just great pop bands that happened to be good at the same time. And that's, you know, that's something that I, I feel as though we've sort of like lost in, in the last decade or whatever, where, 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 where music now, you make a choice between listening to good music or popular music. And that's a shame, I think. So there wasn't a sense in your um, in that the sort of bloody period when um, you know uh, the person, the persona and the person got kind of muddled up in your head. I mean, oh no, absolutely. Closer, we were, we were, it was always very clear the separation. No, I've only it's only only very recently that I've, that I've worked this out for myself. Yeah, it, it, it took about twenty five years for me, <laughs> for me to work it out. But no, I definitely confused the person and the persona for many many years. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, does that make you a bit sort of big-headed to be around, perhaps, sometimes? <laughs> 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I might have got... Um, it might have let my ego get out of control at some point, yeah. But that's all part of it, you know, it's sort of like... You know, that's why people like the soap opera of, 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 of musicians and bands and bloody bloody blah, blah because, because they are out of control. You know, it's not like a nice, regular job where you, you you know, or it shouldn't be. There should be an element of danger in it. There should be an element where it can, at any minute, it can fall apart. And that's the beauty of it. That's kind of like what the rock and roll bullshit kind of theme park cliche is, isn't it? It's about that sort of thing of being on a knife edge. I think. <laughs> and we're just very entertaining for people. Um, <laughs> well, no, but, but because we'd all, we'd, all, we'd all kind of like to do that. Um, most people are, are too nervous, I suppose. Yeah, I, I don't really know why I ended up doing it. Some sort of bizarre sort of self-belief, but I don't really know what that was based on because I wasn't really a very good musician. I kind of like wasn't a particularly talented musician or singer or anything. It took me many, many years to sort of like learn how to do what I did, sort of thing. I just sort of like kept banging my head against a wall and not and 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 and, and, and sort of like you know just not listening to people telling me I was crying. I think perseverance is something that it's a very it's a, it's a very very underrated quality. Um, perseverance, you know. I'm always trying to tell my kids how important perseverance is. You know, just to pick yourself up, and it, when you make a mistake, to pick yourself up and just do it again and try and do it better every time. As long as you know you've got something good to do in the first place. So um, yes. I know I've got something good here, and I'm going to keep doing it. It doesn't matter if I get knocked down because I believe in it. Well, yeah. I mean, that's kind of what happened with the early days of. Of being in Sway, where we, we kind of we got to a point where we felt as though we were writing kind of really good songs, but no one was actually listening. It was a very frustrating time, and we, uh, it was an odd odd period where we were very very out of step with what was going on. It was in kind of like the very very early 90s, so 
Baggy had just finished, you know, the kind of indie dance thing, and shoegazing was kind of fumbling around. And we were kind of writing songs about, um, about British life, but, you know, quite idiosyncratic songs about British life. And it didn't fit in at all with the, with the, with the, with the, with the model at the time. And because of that, A&R men and the industry generally completely ignored us. And that kind of gave us space to kind of like evolve on our own, really. And that's, that was quite interesting, I think. We didn't get picked up on too soon. Which could, which could have been quite bad if you had, if you had got picked up now you look back on it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely, yeah. Um, I think it's, you know, a, a bands, you know, need space to evolve and, and, and grow. And, and especially in, in those days when the music press was sort of jumping on things that looked like they were, m might half happen, you know. Um, I think, you know, all, all art needs to sort of like, needs a space on its own to kind of grow and to contemplate and all these things. You know? <laughs> As far as the sort of um, process of creation goes, um, did you enjoy writing a book, getting a book out there? I did. I, I, I really did enjoy writing it. I, I love the freedom of writing prose. Um, writing songs is incredibly satisfying when you get it right, but it's, you're, you're confined within this prison of, uh, 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 of melody and, and rhyme and, uh, and music, which you're not with writing prose, and I love just the, the uh, writing prose and literally just going where your brain was letting you, you know, w w just wandering off onto a tangent and stuff like that. So I really did enjoy it, yeah. Um, yeah, and I'd like to write some more. Uh, is it? <laughs> yeah, we're going to talk about that for a minute. Um, and then um, in a couple of minutes, we're going to open it out. We've got to walk around Mike, so um, you can put some questions to Brett if that's okay. Yeah, I'll have to uh, kind of beatbox a company when I was We can wrap our questions. Yeah. Yes! <laughs> yes. So the next book, uh, this, this one's called Cold Black Morning. Yes. Um, yes. And uh, can you divulge to us the title of the next book? Which, yeah, the, the is next book you're writing now, or is it finished? I'm, I'm, sort of, I'm kind of finished, I'm kind of nearly finished it. It's called. Ooh. It's called. Thank you. It's called Afternoons with the Blinds Drawn. Oh. Afternoons with the Blinds Drawn. The third one's going to be called Parents' Evening. Yeah. <laughs> A day in the life of bread. <laughs> It's a, so the, the second book is it, it's kind of like uh, in the in the first book. I, what, one of the first things I say is um, I didn't want to write a conventional rock biography, and uh, with this book, I suppose I'm writing a conventional rock biography. In fact, the first chapter is called the book I'd said I wouldn't write. <laughs> uh, but I've tried to I've tried to sort of look at it from a different perspective. I, it's not um, a book. Hopefully, it doesn't it, it doesn't sort of like deal with the cliches of, of success, it sort of like looks at the sort of bathos of, 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 that, that anyone that's been in, in bands knows about, you know, those moments fiddling with bits of cheese backstage, you know, kind of like King Tut's Wah Wah Heart and stuff like that, so it's, <laughs> it's, it's very much about the kind of the crappy little moments that you have to go through, the humiliations, these sorts of things, you know, kind of people looking at you and you kind of looking back and thinking they fancy you and you, they come up to you and they tell you if they think your band's shit, you know. <laughs> That kind of, those kind of moments. I've, I've tried to sort of look at the whole thing with a, through different eyes. So it's not a Motley Crue kind of celebration and bo boastful um, uh, account of, you know, no, exploits. I don't think Pamela no. Anderson's in it, no. no, 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 no. Are you supermodels? No, sorry. No. <laughs> Just airfix models. <laughs> um, the mind boggles. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh dear. what are we doing now? Yeah, so now, <laughs> do you want to go into a thing or Let's have a ripple of applause for questions. So, the lovely Kathleen uh, over there has got the walkabout mic. Um, thanks all so much for coming down, by the way. Yes, thanks. Um, Thank and uh, there are copies of the book there, as I mentioned Woo! earlier. Woo! Let's have the first question. Someone's got to break the ice. Come on. And then after that, oh, we've got loads, sorry. Um, young lady here. We have one here, You've got one there, sorry. We've already got one. We have to unplug so she's not. I did, yeah. I'm sure they can just shout out. Yeah. Well, just shout out, yeah. yeah. And then repeat the question if you can. Okay. Beatboxing isn't that good without a mic, though. <laughs>
Is that working now? Yeah. Okay. Jennifer? Hi. So, Call Black Mornings received so many good and positive critical reviews, besides uh, the fans as well who loved it. Thank you. If it hadn't received as positive reviews as it has done, yeah. how would you approach writing your second book differently? I probably wouldn't have done, to be honest. Really? Yeah, I think it's... Uh, that, that sounds like I'm a kind of puppet of the media and that, that I kind of like just respond to however, you know, whatever the media, however the media responds. But it's interesting, with any work you do, you finishing the work isn't the end of how you feel about it. It's very much, it very much lives um, with, with the audience. And, and you don't really know, if people would sort of say, you know, you release a record and people sort of say, well, what do you think of this record? Where does it rank with your other records? And I always say, well, ask me in a year's time, it's impossible to really judge these things because you're kind of too close to it. And um, yeah, I don't think that I would have bothered writing some more if it had been received really badly, to be honest. Yeah. But good question. Yeah, nice. Um, Hello. I just wondered how you found the machinations of the publishing industry compared <laughs> with the music industry. I, I, do you know what? I, I actually love the publishing and publishing industry. Everyone's really well spoken and very polite. <laughs> <laughs> it's great because the music industry, everyone's kind of like you feel like snobs and they go, yeah, yeah. what? Well, <laughs> and you go to the, my, my go to the pub, I go to my publisher. Oh, I know it, you. They're lovely. Well, the people with little brown are. Yeah, I like that. They've all got degrees oh, yeah. in English and Cambridge. Yeah, yeah. It's not. I, I, I genuinely like them. Maybe it's just the, the time of my, the, you know, the age that I am or something. Like that. I, I, I can't be bothered with sort of like inverted snobs and sort of bullshit and people pretending to be kind of, you know, what they're not. Stuff. But yes, I like I like the publishing industry. It's all right. Hi there. Hello. Um, your dad sounds really interesting. Mm. Can you tell me how um, this influenced your music? Your dad. Well, I mean, you know. Oh, well, he he was obsessed with classical music, uh, and even though I hated it when I was a kid, I think it sort of bled through to to me music. You know. The, 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 I, was, I think I was always looking for the drama in, from his classical music. You know, he used to play Berlioz and Liszt and, uh, and Wagner. Yeah. And I think there's, you know, I, I've never, I've always liked pop music that's quite dramatic and quite tense, and that's possibly his influence, you know, but yeah, that's possibly the, the main one, musical. Hi. Hi. Uh, um, I was really interested in what you're saying about the person and the persona. Yeah. So I came to see you at um, Hammersmith. Two months ago, or yeah, which is great. And, um, how, how how do you know when you are actually you? Because yeah. you're, <laughs> you're a public persona, and you're to a degree you're performing now, mm. right? But you're yeah, out a little bit. You're being a little bit more vulnerable about who you are mm. as a person. So, how do you actually know when you're actually you? Is it like other people, like your family or something? Or how do you know when you're not performing and you're actually being? You, or Normal. is it a yoga session, or what is it? <laughs> Normally when I get, get back home and I just cry in front of the mirror, you know? <laughs> no. Um, no, it's, it's a very, very good question. I, I think we're all, kind of, we're all adopting personas throughout our life every day. Is it the, the moment we wake up, the moment we walk down the street, the moment you sort of like, you, the, the moment you interact with any other human being, you're to some degree adopting a persona, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, it's just that kind of when you're in, in a public eye, in a band or whatever, you, you, that persona becomes kind of it becomes kind of magnified. And so yeah, I, I don't know. It's it's a, it's, a, it's a very very good question. I don't know. Yeah, I'm absolutely adopting a persona now. I'm kind of like this is this isn't sort of a natural state when you're sitting here, up here. Welcome to us. Very very good. <laughs> I, um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to it. Um, this is as much about, uh, it's not really about Cobalt Mornings actually, this is much of this uh, question to Crispin, because yeah. it's to you. I know you've supported Crispin's campaign. Absolutely, yeah. Can I just say what an amazing thing it is that Crispin yeah. does? Yeah. You know, lots of musicians are, are kind of making music and sort of just sleepwalking into this, this, this sort of like oblivion, basically. And Crispin's actually someone that's actually standing up for them and saying, this just isn't, isn't acceptable at all, so well done. Absolutely. Excellent. Yeah. Sorry, Karen. No, no, no. That's absolutely.
kind of my point. Yeah, I mean, that's, um, I've kind of wanted to support him with the Google demonstration because A, he's my friend, and B, it was yeah, an amazing absolutely. thing to, to, to be involved with. Thank you. You met a massive um, amount <laughs> to the whole demonstration that you turned up as well, everyone made. Ooh, that's real. <laughs> <laughs> and Google went, oh shit, it's <laughs> real. <laughs> Oh, Did Google actually change their uh, minds about the whole thing when they were Brett was involved? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, they were they were pretty terrified by the entire process. It's it's terrifying and annoying. Yeah. Change your search engine. I used to be an IT person, and I had the privilege of working with Tim Berners-Lee. Right, amazing. Yeah. Wow. Um, he was one of the founder members of the company I used to work for. Mm. And he actually said, I asked him um, how he would have felt before he created the internet. Um, if he'd known the bad it could have been used for as well as the good. And he said he didn't actually know if he could have gone forward if he'd known the other things that it was going to be used for. So wow. same question to you guys. You know, with Online sharing and. I thought you were going to say, uh, uh, how do you feel about the, about Britpop or something? <laughs> <laughs> Would you have heard them writing those songs in 1991? <laughs> if you know Britpop, what's going to happen? <laughs> I'm really sorry about that. I never hold this one to that, you know. Oasis. <laughs> <laughs> That's many other people's fault. But um, both of you, actually, because I think you know, uh, I was a big Lockheed fan as well. So, both of you, how would you have felt if you'd known? that you were on the forefront of that change in music going forward, you know, that if it was going to end up in that digital sharing, people not earning any money from it anymore, mm. would you have still done everything that you've done or would you have wiggled and would you have started protesting about that? Well, it would have shown incredible foresight to have started protesting about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, I, I, no, I, I don't know. Would you want to answer that? I think it's. Uh, I mean, this is this is the thing that that all the free people assume the entire time. They assume, and and an awful lot of the, you know the public and musicians themselves think that it somehow ruins the purity of music if you want to be able to make a living out of it. But um, but but what they don't understand, and there's a lot of people that that hold that argument now, there's a lot of people that say that it, all creativity should be free and that you're being selfish by wanting to make a living out of it. But they're the same people who are saying, oh, I want, you know, I want to be able to share your music and I want to be able to share your, um, you know, your films and the memes made from your films. There wouldn't be any fucking memes if there wasn't, if people couldn't make money out of it because you couldn't make the films in the first place. Duh! <laughs> so they, you know, they, there is a real kind of deliberate um, misunderstanding that that free and um, you know free freedom of speech, freedom of information. Um, we all want that. We all think that the ability to be able to find anything you want in the internet, but it doesn't mean free to have somebody else's somebody else's work, free to exploit somebody else's work, or free to exploit somebody else's life. And I don't think Tim Berners-Lee meant it to be that no, either. And um, I, I also think there's a, there's a, in all life, you know, the idea of laws and the things that hold us together as a society and that why we built laws, you know, there is a, there's a movement within the hyper-liberal, liberal, um, you know, uh, Ayn Rand style, um, you know, Cyber libertarians that are moving moving around at the moment, that, that that are trying to push a kind of trying to destroy democracy because they think it's not progressive, it's old fashioned. But there was a really good guy called Lex Stanislav who instantly was a, a Russian poet and he was censored heavily to the point where he had to dig his own grave. And he wrote this great line <laughs> saying, "Is it is it progress if a cannibal eats with a fork?" Which I think is a is a is a lovely <laughs> point. And. Um, and also, in all in all society, our you know your right to swing your fist ends at the end of my nose. So you can't mm. you know we we have to be aware of each other's each other's ability to carry on sustaining, and we have to respect that, and we have to respect culture and creativity. Otherwise, 
there would just be there'll be nothing to share except for home movies. You know, you you can have Jake Paul or Tolstoy. It's your yeah. choice. Yeah. Mike, 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 Mike. My main point, uh, I can't take credit for this, but people can, when, when we release videos these days, they're quite low budget, and people will complain uh, online about how low budget they are, but they'll be watching them for free, you know. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's a massive paradox, you know. Yeah. You know, watching them for free, so there's no, that's why there's no budget for them. Yeah. I think we've got time for one more question, have we? Yeah. Go on there, yeah. Um, Maybe yes. Maybe we should share. Oh, can we share? Can we share? Can we share? Oh, yeah. So, uh, thanks for coming out. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for coming. Um, so, I just want to ask, when Sweet first started releasing uh, records or music, there was a lot of bands like, uh, you mentioned the Auteurs, uh, Early Pulp, then, um, um, then bands that had this kind of art, glam, Romanticism, like British romanticism. Yeah. And then when sort of Brit pop or British pop came in, and Oasis came in, it kind of went in another direction. Yeah. It was very lazy, in whatever fashion that was. Do you yes. feel that? Like, how do you feel about that? Do you feel that we missed out artistically in where, to some degree, that that the music and the bands that um, were oscillating around like your music were going? Well, yeah, I suppose I do in lots of ways. I do think it was kind of hijacked by, you know, this kind of tri tribe of kind of ruffians. It, it, it was overtly <laughs> 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 misogynistic, kind of like jingoistic, you know, just awful. It became a sort of awful self-parody. So, yeah, in lots of ways, you know. But, but what can you say? I, I, I never personally had an intention of starting a scene. You know, it wasn't like I was kind of thinking that I wanted to be part of the vanguard of the scene. It was just, this is something that people sort of, that I've noticed. People sort of rewrite the truths of the present to fit, fit you know, rewrite the past to fit the truths of the present slightly. And there was never any scene, even with, you know, it, it, certainly not until 1993 or something like that, you know, when we first started, the first couple of singles, it, it felt like we were kind of cutting our way through a, through a forest on their own, but yeah, absolutely. I think it. I think it was kind of hijacked slightly, and it did become a bit of a self-parody. But you know, the, I think at the, at the core of any successful and interesting scene, there's all. There's always, no matter how much you, you, how much it becomes a, a, a bloated self-parody, there's always something good about it. About it. There's always a germ of a good idea, and I think the germ of the good idea with Britpop was the rejection of American cultural imperialism. Yeah, it was about looking at what the, the world we, we saw around us and documenting that world rather than singing about California or something else or, or, or Golden Gate Bridge or something like that. It was about sing, singing about the, the world we saw around us. And that was quite a beautiful thing, but that's, you know, that's, and that got kind of like turned into this horrible sort of like carry on film, kind of like cartoon sort of thing. But at the, at the, at the core of it was a, was a, decent, I mean, de a decent principle. So we're going to have to wind up um, um, because we need a bit of time for foot signing. For pudding? Oh. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Kathy, are we doing are we foot signing then pudding or is it pudding then foot signing? We're signing now at the same time. I can sign them in. We're pudding and foot signing. I can sign them in pudding. <laughs> Uh, putting a book signing simultaneously. So I'm really sorry about the, the, the last questions, um, but um, we do need some time to uh, uh, for the book I'll signing. Ask the questions over there. Um, and uh, you might be able to ask the questions um, while getting your book signed. Um, but uh, is there any leaves we can say? Thank you so much to our three guests this evening: yeah. Olivia Cheney. Thank you so much, that was um, hauntingly beautiful. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, Crispin Hunt. Um, he's smashing the system um, while delivering very long lectures about it. <laughs> um, like you. And uh, <laughs> Thank you so much for coming.
was a really lovely evening. Brett Anderson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.